I mentioned in the review for Eye of the Beholder that American Gothic often felt like an old EC Comics morality tale. Damned If You Don't is the first episode to make good on that with a tale of revenge on someone whose actions deserve retribution. Caleb and Boone are playing an ill-advised game of hide-and-seek in the junkyard. This version seems to be based on the local legend of Wash Sutpin, a sort of boogeyman of Trinity. Sutpin's gonna get you, Boone. Carter Bowen, the resident junkyard caretaker, comes out to chase them off and, of course, runs into Lucas Buck. Lucas mentions some nasty business between Carter and Wash Sutpin's underage daughter several years earlier, and Carter thanks Lucas for covering it up. How could I forget what you've done for me? Lucas says it's time to pay up, though, by signing a parental consent form for Carter's 15-year-old daughter Poppy to come work for him at the sheriff's office. I'll give you till midnight. Gail, meanwhile, rents a house from one of the locals. Her newspaper editor is furious, but she thinks there's a story to be written about Trinity. Now I gotta call you back. Caleb and Boone are preparing for their science projects in Miss Coombs' class. Selena says since Caleb's parents aren't alive, he can bring Sheriff Buck. A grumpy Caleb basically tells her to mind her own business. All materials for your project must be common household items. No buying stuff at the hobby store. Gail arrives at the junkyard to drop off her air conditioner to be fixed and notices her parents' old rusted out wagon. Carter sees her looking at the car and reminisces about Gail's parents. He says Wash tried to sell the car, but people think it's jinxed on account of how they died. Carter makes the decision not to sign the form and goes to bed, but he's awakened by a nightmare at 11.56 p.m. He's spooked by his wife Etta doing laundry in the basement and a freak electrical accident sends her to the hospital. Sheriff Buck pays a courtesy call and gives Carter a makeup task, since he didn't sign the release form on time. Let's forget about Poppy. I understand. He just has to pick up Lucas's friend from the bus station. Another battle for Caleb's soul takes place on the porch, as Dr. Matt tries to get Caleb to do his homework in a way that will help him learn. But Sheriff Buck shows up and tells him that making a fancy science project that wows the other kids is all that's important. And cutting corners is a means to an end. Lucas catches Gail snooping around the junkyard and flirts with her. You can tell something's going to happen because Gail has that you-instantly-annoy-me attitude. Of course, the man Carter has been sent to collect at the bus station is old Wash Setpin himself, who was released early from prison on the good word of Sheriff Buck. And interestingly, he hasn't aged a day. Poppy immediately takes a fascination to him. The other strings that are attached quickly become evident as Lucas tells Carter that he's going to have to board Wash in his spare bedroom. Over dinner, Poppy asks what it's like to kill a man, and Wash says he was just protecting his daughter. The fellow was taking liberties with my daughter. Turned out it was the wrong man, though. Buck takes the opportunity to throw Carter under the bus in the sly way that Lucas generally does. Your daddy used to work for Mr. Sutpen right about the time all this was happening. He had something of a crush. Well, anyway. Everybody deserves a second chance. This is an excellent scene from Michael Perry and Stephen Gagan, and it's the type that epitomizes the show. Meanwhile, Merlin reappears to Caleb and warns him against taking shortcuts. He's too excited about his makeshift tornado science project to listen, though. Gail also gets some quality time in with Caleb, fishing with him and talking about the newspaper business. They worked hand in hand until the day they died. How they die? There was a fire in the printing room. Was it an accident? I don't know. I know maybe someday you could help me find out. Why me? Because you're my cousin. That night, Poppy comes to wash his bedroom and he shows her a secret compartment in the toy train he made her in prison. And when she asks what the secret compartment is for, he tells her that she already knows what it's for. You didn't tell me what it's for. The little compartment. You already know what it's for. The next day, Poppy and Wash have an erotic popsicle session on the porch before Carter gets home. <laughs> There's a scene in Martin Scorsese's remake of Cape Fear, in which the villain Max Cady isolates and seduces Sam Bowden's daughter Danielle, and gets her to suck on his thumb before kissing her deeply. For parents, it's regarded as one of the most frightening moments in the film. Poppy's popsicle scene was likely directly inspired by Cape Fear. How old is your Poppy now? She just turned 15 last month. Ah, darn. Child has to be 16 to be legal. This episode is so goddamn creepy. Poppy goes for a float on a hot day in her sheer white sundress, and of course Wash jumps her and they frolic in the lake. Carter chases her off and goes to Lucas to beg him to make another arrangement, but Lucas basically tells him to man up. 
can't arrest a man for swimming. At the science fair, Caleb initially wows the kids and parents, but Lucas pipes up so Caleb confesses to buying his project and disqualifies himself. But then Dr. Matt urges him to tell the class about Bernoulli's principle, and Caleb is able to rattle off why a tornado happens. Tell them about Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle says the inside of a tornado has very low air pressure. Sheriff Buck is perturbed, but Merle reappears and says the whole family is proud of him. Elsewhere, Carter hears Poppy giggling and finds Wash wandering the halls outside her room. He warns Wash to clear out or else. Later that night, Carter hears rustling coming from Poppy's room and bursts in with his shotgun. Carter is so keyed up he doesn't realize that it's just Etta checking on Poppy until he's already fired. Carter is taken into custody, Wash Sutpin literally disappears into the night, and Lucas tells TJ the Apprentice that he should take over the junkyard slash repair shop. Lucas could even put in a good word on a small business loan, but TJ might owe him a small favor later. Whew. Wow. Um, okay. This is a difficult one to talk about because of the quality of the episode and its problematic themes. So let's start with the easy stuff and work our way up. The casting for this episode is excellent, as the main cast recedes into the background for a potboiler B-plot to keep the fires burning while the guest stars take center stage. Steve Rankin is a well-known character actor who's appeared in everything from Buffy the Vampire Slayer to L.A. Noir. His sweaty, unhinged performance as Carter carries this episode. Muse Watson is probably best known as the fisherman from I Know What You Did Last Summer, but his biggest break was a regular spot on NCIS. Bridget Branagh got her start on The Tracy Ullman Show at 16, and has been a steady presence on television ever since, most notably on Angel and Marvel's Runaways. All three actors play their roles to perfection. The episode was penned by longtime TV writer Michael R. Perry and future Oscar winner Stephen Gagan. Perry had already worked in the genre on the cult hit Eerie Indiana. Gagan was still a neophyte at this point, but he'd use American Gothic to hone the edgy moral complexity that would mark his later works. The team of Perry and Gagan would go on to win a primetime Emmy for NYPD Blue before Gagan pivoted to feature films. His screenplay for Syriana was nominated for an Academy Award, and his screenplay for Traffic won the Academy Award. Sadly, his screenplay for 2020's Doolittle did not. Damned If You Don't is an episode that is wickedly entertaining because you just know that Carter not only is going to get, but actually deserves his punishment. Lucas's schemes are often amoral, which means we occasionally get something like this episode where he maneuvers the chess pieces on the board in such a way that a poetic tragedy ensues. The episode is so well written that they didn't even feel the need to fill it with lengthy montages of flash cuts and filters. Those are reserved for the times when they make sense. Now for the unsavory elements of the episode. There's nothing technically wrong with Perry and Gagan's script. It's the leanest and most satisfying episode of the series so far, and one that pushes the boundaries of where they wanted to go. The problem is that Poppy's sexualization by Wash isn't met with repulsion. It's met with fascination, arousal, even enthusiasm. Wash's actions aren't portrayed as a crime against her, but a crime against Carter. If you ever wondered why one of the major demands of the Me Too movement in Hollywood was to push for more female writers, this episode would be Exhibit A. The script indulges two problematic male fantasies simultaneously, being a part of a young girl's sexual awakening and the justified taking of life to protect your family. These narratives, and Poppy's sexualized role, would likely have been workshop by a different voice in the room. And if you think that wouldn't be beneficial, just remember that Bridget Branagh was 23 years old playing 15. Imagine the popsicle scene, or the swimming scene, with an actual 15-year-old actress. The casting of 23-year-old Branna allows the audience to ignore some of the storytelling implications. Everything from the music cues to the lighting to the languorous camera shots of Poppy's lips, legs, and breasts implicates the audience in her sexualization just as much as Wash. But since we know that there's going to be some kind of poetic justice at the end, we allow ourselves to be complicit. For most American audiences, including myself, the payoff of someone getting justice at the end especially violent justice, is worth the crime that they commit. Oh, I wish I could have caught him doing it. I'd have given anything to catch that asshole doing it. It would have been worth him doing it, just so I could have caught him. There's an odd sort of satisfaction in that justice, and an even greater fear in what we're willing to sacrifice to get that satisfaction. 